Most people associate the west coast of BC as being a wet, temperate rainforest. And they're right for the most part, except for a tiny sliver of land on southeastern Vancouver Island, in the Gulf Islands, and on small parts of the mainland coast. The coastal dry forests of British Columbia, that is the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem, and the adjacent driest parts of the coastal western hemlock ecosystems constitute less than 1% of BC's land area, yet contain the greatest number of endangered species. Most of the human population of BC lives here in Victoria, Duncan, Nanaimo, Powell River, and much of Vancouver. Diverse Salish-speaking First Nations cultures span the entire region. Sharp-tailed snakes, western bluebirds, band-tailed pigeons, alligator lizards, bewix wrens, and bush tits are all characteristic wildlife in these coastal dry forests, while the Lewis's woodpecker that once ate the Gary Oak acorns has now been extirpated. I spent about 30 years of my career describing and mapping climatic zones in British Columbia, among other things. And uh, the coastal Douglas fir and uh, the very dry coastal western hemlock zones are the areas on British Columbia's coast that are in the rain shadow, either of the Vancouver Island Mountains or the Olympic Mountains in Washington State. And so when people think of British Columbia's coast, they probably think of rainforest and areas that are dripping wet year round. But we actually live in an area that sees probably between 750 and 1200 millimeters of total annual precipitation. That's about a meter of precipitation in a year, comparable to a lot of other places in Canada. As well, uh, it's an area that's uh, arrayed around the uh, Salish Sea, and so being close to the ocean has a, a very moderate climate. That means compared with the rest of Canada, the winters are warmer, the summers are cooler. It happens to be a climate that an awful lot of people find appealing, a mild yet fairly dry climate and so it was one of the first areas populated by European settlers in British Columbia. Douglas fir dominates most of this region. While considered to be shade intolerant in other areas, young Douglas firs will grow here under the canopies of the adult trees. So this is an example of the thick corky bark of the ancient Douglas firs that you can even see the fire scars here that essentially protected these giant Douglas firs from the uh, episodic fires that naturally rage through these ecosystems. So uh, yeah, it's probably more than 20 centimeters thick. That's for sure, it's more like a foot thick plus. Unbelievable. So here's a cool feature of the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem, a so-called tree's knees, or a living stump. Uh, just like other trees, Douglas fir's roots are connected together through a fungal connection, mycorrhizal fungi, through which uh, nutrients and information are exchanged between trees. But Douglas fir goes even further, where their roots directly graft into the roots of what should be a dead stump, but instead they send nutrients through the root grafting uh, to heal over the stump, and the uh, stump continues to play a role in the whole underground uh, root networks of nutrient and information exchange. Arbutus trees are strikingly distinctive trees in these coastal dry forests and are just about the most beautiful trees in Canada with their red and orange bark, which are as smooth as human skin when they're younger. They're Canada's only evergreen broadleaf tree, that is, they don't drop their leaves each fall, unlike all the other broadleaf trees here. Gary oaks are even more characteristic here, with their gnarly contorted shapes and beautiful lichen-covered bark. British Columbia's only native oak tree, a white oak, is also one of Canada's rarest and most endangered trees. While sometimes found in pure forested stands, they're often associated with beautiful meadows and rocky outcrops filled with wildflowers in the spring. And sometimes the oak is growing on very shallow soils, on, on rocky headlands and things like that. But we do have some areas where you get Gary Oak forming large trees on deep, rich soils. And they're oftentimes accompanied by the most fabulous wildflower displays that we see in British Columbia at sea level. These oak meadows were maintained by First Nations for millennia by burning and other management practices because among the, the plants that were uh, cultivated in those areas, the native plants, uh, included some food plants like great camas and common camas. And so they would uh, essentially manage these lands 
by burning to maintain them as open meadows and uh, produce not only starch food crops like the bulbs of these plants, but also uh, to maintain open areas that made hunting a little bit easier. Uh, and this practice carried on for thousands of years. We have good evidence of this. Something that my uncle John Elliot Stalkwith once said to me and to a group of youth was that we needed to practice our Kwisantnich ways of being. And if we stopped practicing our Kwisantnich ways of being, we would no longer be Kwisantnich people. The way that we connect to land, the way that we connect to our foods, the way that our teachings are wrapped into all of those things, that's what makes us Kwisantnich people. That's where my identity is and um, it's important for my sense of belonging and also for my children's sense of belonging in this world. In our territories, we use salal, fern, and different types of algae. You place the rocks in the hole in the ground, you build the fire on top, shovel out um, any remaining wood after a few hours. You end up having a layer of hut rocks greenery, wrapped food, another layer of greenery, canvas, and then you pour soil on top. All plants share stories and they tell a history and so it's a reminder to me of um, where I come from, who I am. It's important that I pass those things on to my daughter and to my children and that we keep those things alive and I think it's important to practice those things in my life. When the first settlers arrived in Victoria there were all kinds of complaints about the the smoke that would cloud the city when they, the Salish and others would burn the oak meadows. The traditional burning was shut down by the settlers around the turn of the 20th century and the meadows began to disappear. These oak meadows uh, that were fairly widespread uh, around southeastern Vancouver Island when the first European settlers arrived uh, also proved to be the best places to practice agriculture, the best places to build houses, uh, the best places to settle. And so we find that less than 5% of the Gary Oak Meadows that existed at contact are still there today, and a lot of them are in very poor condition. Over 95% of these Gary Oak ecosystems have been destroyed now, largely underneath the city of Victoria, when they are jam-packed with endangered species. Invasive species like Scotch broom and Himalayan blackberry crowd out the native plants, while a lack of fires these days is allowing Douglas fir to colonize the meadows and supplant the oaks. Unfortunately, massive suburban sprawl, agricultural expansion, industrial logging, only 1% of the old growth remains today here, fire suppression, controlled burns are sorely needed, and invasive species all threaten these coastal dry forests. We're a small group of about seven or eight faithful uh, by and large seniors, by chance here mostly women, and every week we come here and we work for three hours, four hours. But it's perseverance that wins the battle. It's been a major transformation. What has happened is the Gary Oak Meadows were dominated by Scotch broom. We now have camas in the spring, beautiful giant camas. We have in our forests, in the parts where we've had the capacity to remove it, the licorice fern is coming back, our trees are, are free of, of ivy, and our children don't have to worry about uh, coming in contact with poisonous Daphne. But we have to keep at it. We've been working here now for two plus months, removing the invasive species, the blackberry, the ivy, and the daphne. What we know from experience is that with the rains, we have seeds buried in the ground, and the native flowers, the native plants, will come back, and the few remaining native shrubs basically come back into their own. The coastal Douglas fir ecosystem is among the top four most endangered ecosystems in Canada, along with the antelope brush ecosystems or pocket desert in southern BC, the Carolinian ecosystems in southern Ontario, and the tall grass prairie in Manitoba. Already almost 40% of this ecosystem is under agriculture or cities. Unfortunately, it's one of the most underrepresented ecosystems in BC's protected area system, with only 8% of the original area under some form of protection. 
Well, land acquisition fund is critical for this part of the world. About 94% of British Columbia is provincial crown land. Uh, the only area that is really different from that land ownership pattern is southeastern Vancouver Island and the southern Gulf Islands, which are almost entirely private land. And so if you want to protect some areas just about anywhere in the province, you can work with the provincial government or First Nations on trying to achieve some kind of protection on that land base. If you want to protect land on southeastern Vancouver Island, the southern Gulf Islands, the, the coastal Douglas fir zone, and the uh, very dry coastal western hemlock zone, you need to buy private land. And so an acquisition fund is an absolute necessity. This is an area where it's possible oftentimes to buy this land, but very expensive. It's uh, with the support of individuals, agencies, and all levels of government that people that can achieve conservation outcomes uh, in the CDF and, and adjacent areas. For the limited public lands, such as Crown lands and unused Department of National Defense lands, which are all unceded First Nations territories, it's vital that the new protected areas are established involving funding from the provincial and federal governments to support Indigenous protected areas. Most of the international community is moving to expand protected areas now in an attempt to avert the biodiversity and extinction crises. The BC government needs to get on board by committing to greatly expand its protected area system in all ecosystem types, including in these extremely endangered coastal dry forests. Doing so will support our health, the economy, and the quality of life for millions of British Columbians.